Candy is dandy, but liquor is quicker. That is true. Mm -hmm. So they say. Yeah. But quicker to what? I don't, know. I don't know. All right, it's a mystery. All right, so we've got one guest today. Hey, Dick, you're on, you're on for the whole rest of the show. <laughs> Yay. All right. Yay. Come on over. Right. Come on so, down here. Welcome to uh, this, uh, this segment of Cape Cod Clam Chatter with Dick Wheeler, world adventurer, former museum curator, and uh, you were a teacher before that? Do you know, do you remember, do you remember when we met? We met in the early 1990s. Chris Vigard was a, did you remember Chris Vigard from MCET? Uh, what's his name? Chris, girl, Chris Vigard. Uh, no, I don't, I don't recall. You don't recall? Yeah. Anyway, she, ha she arranged to have you appear uh, at MCET. You, did, you gave some lessons. Oh, MCET? Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, I was an engineer there at the time. All right. Well, I did a, that was where you and I I did a, a, a show for MSET for two or three years. Right, right. Exactly. That, that's that's where we met. Then. Yeah. That, that was, was in the engineering department. That was a lot of fun. Yeah. So I think you need to move over here a little bit more, Dick, this way. I mean, all right. And um, I actually, I just wanted to mention that, you know, we don't often have people that they've made Nova specials out of. <laughs> and and is, that off the, is that off the front of the? Uh, cool. Yes. All right, well, we're going to get that. I just want to run this, if you don't mind, just one second. Um, let me see, where did it go? Here it is. And uh, all right, can you get that up there? There we go. Oh. Just, I just want to, in case anybody else has seen this. Scientists know exactly when the oh, last off died, but questions remain. Are these modern day cousins of the Ark also in danger? Wheeler took to the sea in a one man kayak, an amazing journey following the haunted cry of a long gone bird. So there's the, there's the Dick Wheeler. Uh, no, we, we can't run the whole thing, needless to say. <laughs> Although it is going to be airing. The whole thing is going to be airing That's on the what show. Steve said, yes. Yeah, yeah. We, it's, it's all edited. It's ready to go. Well, you have to put the little it disclaimer first on the front. aired in 1994. <clears throat> uh huh. So, anyway, welcome to the show. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I've been, you, you've been someone that I've been wanting to, wanting to have on the show for a long time. So, well, thank I'm you. glad you finally made mm -hmm. it. Um, and I didn't know about the whole vote thing. I didn't know you were right. involved in that at all. I thought it was Jack Kent was supposed right. to be coming. Yeah. Um, and uh, so anyway, I, I've been wanting you, wanting you oh, on to talk about yeah. this. Yeah. So, right. so um, can we talk about that? Sure. All right. Um, I noticed you brought some stuff. I didn't, didn't know what they well, were you want to talk about the, We could do, yeah. talk about that real quick. And then, but Actually, I really like, want to get into what you've done uh, in your right. lifetime well, because it's that. a really but interesting yeah. story. In, in brief, um, you know, there's been... Um, you know, there, there are strong concerns around town. I want to keep, keep it apolitical, no. but the part that I have, and I have very strong feelings about a lot of it, mm -hmm. but there's one thing that, uh, that I felt very strongly about as you know, we you know, entered into the election season, is that there were people who were behind issues, specific issues, people behind specific candidates, but what really was needed was someone to just work to get more votes. Mm -hmm. And as I tell people as I go around town, so I, yes, I, I have some very strong feelings about uh, changing the form of government, but I would hate to see a big decision like that made by just a very small number of people. If 8,000 people come out and vote for something that I wouldn't have voted for myself, I'll be able to take it. Yeah. Uh, so really, that's what I'm, I'm pushing for. And it's, and it's hard to do when you have some of the strong feelings that I do. So I, I think I'm professional enough to uh, pull it off. And also, I made a pledge to Mark Andrews that when I presented this to him, that it was going to be apolitical. I wasn't going to handle this sign just to people who I, I know I felt the way I did. And to underscore that, uh, when we got all the, when I got all the stuff and I bought it all with my own money, as I didn't want to have it painted by any of that, uh, and I didn't want to have anyone tell me that what color it should be. And I, I, I chose uh, green in particular because uh, if, if it had red, it would mean something in a subliminal way. If it was, the signs were blue, it would send a message to some people. Mm -hmm. I wanted to be independent of all of that. So uh, to the extent that it, I can be accused of anything, it's, it's tree hugger green, but that's, just, <laughs> that's motherhood. You don't mind being yeah, accused no. of being and, a tree hugger, I'm and, sure. And this, this uh, car, the car, which I think is pretty, pretty nice. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, I have a lot, a lot of those, and let's see those around. Uh, and the, I have these in quantity. 
but I think I have 200 of these larger signs that should show here in the background, and people, they're popping up around town. Mm -hmm. One of the great things about this, a uh, great advantage I have over uh, the traditional candidate for Oops. office, is that I don't have to find people did something happen? Yeah, the, right behind the sign. Oh, you the, just oh mentioned dear. the sign oh and dear. it just all well, fell down. Uh, that's not a subliminal message. <laughs> <ever. Yeah. laughs> but I don't have to find people who say believe in a candidate. Mm -hmm. uh, I can pick the, uh, the best places to put a sign. I mm -hmm. can find a, an intersection and say, wow, I can ask the people if I can put the sign there. Oh. And I've also concentrated on businesses. If you drive down the main street of Onset, it's hard to find a a storefront that doesn't have one of those signs yeah. in it. And now I'm working on the main street of, oh. of Wareham. The, uh, Mark Andrews uh, had a very strong response, favorable response to it. And uh, uh, the first thing I did was give signs to all the selectmen. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, and uh, Walter Cruz did that for me. So it's been an interesting experience. I can tell there's a lot of uh, uh, interest and growing interest in it that I can't take credit for. Mm -hmm. I'm just writing that, uh, you know, this the seasonal thing, and I think the, uh, uh, you know, the, the incumbents uh, 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 nationwide are, are, are you know, in oh. danger in this. So it's going to be an interesting experience, and it's uh, just fun to be play this small part in it. Uh -huh. Well, nobody can complain about wanting people to go out and vote. That no, is our responsibility. It's not just it's it's a it's not just a right. It's a duty. Well, it, it should be a duty. Yeah, it, <laughs> it is. really should. It is. Um, so anyway, okay. I'm all about. All right. So well, thank you. That that being said, let's start paddling. <laughs> let's, <laughs> let's start paddling exactly. <laughs> so um, I know I know that the the Nova series explains the genesis of your yeah. trip. But before we even get into the trip, can you tell us a little bit about um, what? You, what you maybe even back as far as what your childhood was like and what I mean you, you I would imagine you didn't just all of a sudden fall in love with the environment no, and the outdoors no, you must no, have started it's a lifelong experience. Mm. Can you life. tell us a little bit? Yeah. The reason the reason I, I, I like to start people w uh, about telling them that when they're young is because hopefully the young people that are watching this will be inspired by some of the things that you you've experienced. Well, I uh, I grew up in Marshfield mm -hmm. on the water. Uh, my father was very supportive of our boating interests. Uh -huh. He participated in themselves. Um, I started, uh, I was a commercial clam digger in the summertime when I was 11 years old. Uh -huh. And uh, with my younger brother, we, we worked and we, we bought a dory. I had a paper route. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we bought a, a dory for $35. Uh -huh. uh, uh, and then we started. Wait a minute, wait a minute. You can't yeah. just say dory because I, I'm, I'm pretty sure not everybody knows what a, what a dory is. I know what a dory is only because you know over in Nantucket there used to be a restaurant called yeah. the dory. And oh. so I found out what it was. But well, it's a, a New England design. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, it was used by fishermen uh, from the from the beginning it's of the colonial days. It's a boat. It's yeah. a rowing boat, rowing boat uh, right. and uh, it's a, almost double-ended. Uh, they have a great capacity. Uh, they they're not really great rowing boats. I always said they they row best when they're half full of fish because that, that weighs them down nicely. Oh. But they're a very useful boat, and uh, that's what my brother and I had. We started lobstering. My father gave support to that. And when the first thing you know, we had a small lobster boat, and then we got a larger lobster boat. And that's what I did in the summertime all through uh, school and college. Really? Wow. Uh, and my brothers actually stayed at it. One brother uh, went right into lobstering. The other brother uh, was a regular Navy officer. He retired as a no Navy uh, a captain and a destroyer captain. And he started lobstering himself. Oh, you guys are really yeah. Aquarius people. Yeah. So it's, uh, it's in, in my blood, I guess. Yeah, I guess. And so I've been interested in, in, uh, in the outdoors, interested in, uh, as a naturalist. Um, uh, I'm not a, a professional naturalist, but a, a pretty well-read amateur naturalist. Mm -hmm. So when I reached the stage of my life, uh, and I was the, the museum director in Boston, which was, it was now fun. Now, what museum was that? I was the USS Constitution Museum. Oh, really? Yeah, oh. And it, was, it was a lot of fun. I did that for seven years. But uh, you know, through my naturalist reading, I, I really became concerned, especially about the fisheries of the Western Atlantic. Mm -hmm. I followed them very closely. I knew the people in the business. And I could see dwindling stocks. I could see threatening signs. And I just had the same, same kind of feeling, not unlike this, but yeah. on a larger scale, right. that maybe somebody could raise awareness about this. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I had strong support to uh, people who believed in me. To, they funded me to just take some time out to 
to figure out what, how I could best do it. Well, that created a problem, really, because I, was, I, I hadn't even had high school biology course. Mm -hmm. I'd done a lot, read a lot of biology, but I hadn't, was not a student, uh, authentic, I wasn't a scientist. Mm -hmm. uh, my undergraduate training was uh, English literature, that's what I taught. But I had read widely in all branches of natural history, so I could talk to scientists. Well, the uh, thing is about science is that you need two kinds of people in science. You need people that do the science, and you need people that can explain the science. Well, I think you, you and if, I'm, I'm sure you yeah, probably yeah. you probably know yeah. the story of, of uh, Einstein and his peers, yeah. and how that you know there was there was one guy that said, well, there's yeah. there's three people that on um, that uh, know how that understand the uh, theory of relativity: Einstein, myself, and one other person. Yeah. Um, and so it really is necessary to have yeah. people that. Have have That's that right, understanding of yeah. what words mean and yeah. how you put words together in order to explain to people what science is about. So well, it's an important uh, job. It is. The, the breakthrough was when I created uh, a, uh, a bio a, that included all of the things that, that make me what I was. So that means that in addition to my college training and my school work and uh, uh, administrative background, I, I entered the, the kayaking. In, mm -hmm. I was a very strong kayaker. I'd done marathon kayaking. I was undefeated until I was 54 years old in, in the big kayak marathons. Uh, so uh, I tossed that into the mix. Mm -hmm. And I just one day I was just thinking about, you know, I really wanted to concentrate on the Gulf of Maine. Uh, and that's what I knew best. And I, I wanted something that was symbolic of the entire Gulf of Maine. And I, and I read about the, again about the story of the great auk, mm -hmm. which is a now extinct bird that once paddled. Uh, they came into life in just one small island off the north coast, uh, northern coast of Newfoundland. And, uh, and th with the young, they, they, as soon as the young were able to do it, they paddled to their winter quarters, which were Cape Cod Bay. And I there is an interesting animal because it covers the entire Gulf of Maine plus the Grand Banks of Newfoundland, and uh, it, it just shows that everything really is connected. And it also shows what human beings can do when they zero in on an animal for money. Mm -hmm. And a bird which once existed in numbers of just staggering numbers, they mm -hmm. filled vessels with their bodies, they filled vessels with their, with their eggs. Mm -hmm. And the, really the remarkable thing is that they lasted as long as they did. It was 300 years before they got the last one. Now what was it that people were after? Well, first uh, they were meat. Uh, they, you know, it was as if they had been provided birds. after this long voyage over from Europe. There were okay. these birds that were just so easy to get; they couldn't fly. Uh -huh. uh, and when they when they were on land, it was for the purpose of uh, raising their, their years young. Uh -huh. So that when you chase them off the island, they came right back to protect the eggs. So it right. was really slaughter. Right. Uh, it's only because the island is so difficult to get aboard, uh, and because the water around there is just so difficult. Uh, it's just a, a very feared part of the, the ocean for mm -hmm. Newfoundlanders still. So I did what a... Was the, what was the name of the, the island? The name is Funk Island. Funk is an old word that means a smell that's worse than anything you can imagine. <laughs> and you can imagine hundreds of thousands yeah, of birds Yeah, Funk is there. one of those words that, yeah, that sounds like yeah. what it is. And it is a, <laughs> it's amazing. I'm very... Um, I don't know, there aren't many people in the world who have been on Funk Island, and I've been on board twice. Uh -huh. so, and uh, it's really an amazing experience. <laughs> So I planned, I spent a year and a half planning it. I had the support of the Canadian government. I had the support of New England Aquarium, the Museum of Science, and really virtually every environmental uh, uh, institution along the way. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I made it happen. <laughs> um, the lessons that are available from this, um, is there, I, I, I hear fishermen be, commercial fishermen, um, that are obviously really upset about the fact that there are um, entities out there that want to limit what they're allowed to catch. Now, if they were aware of this particular thing, and, and the reason I'm talking about birds yeah. as opposed mm -hmm. to fish is because they're very visible to everybody. Yeah. Why is that lesson so hard for them to understand, or am I misunderstanding something? As, I think as, as far yeah, as I know, yeah, those agencies yeah, are based yeah. on, on academics and people who really have nothing yeah. to gain right. by saying, you need to not fish so much, right. or yeah. you're not going to have that stock yeah. to fish anymore. Right. That seems to be a hard lesson for fishermen yeah, it to is, learn. It is hard. And, and, and by the way, loggers as well. Yeah. Well, you know, what you hit on something that uh, I should have mentioned. The original storyline for my trip was to raise awareness about the living relatives of the great auk, mm -hmm. the, the, the murres and the guillemots right. and the puffins. They're all they're related. Um, 
I didn't think the metaphor would stretch to the fish, although I knew the fish were in trouble. Uh, so, but when I got up to Newfoundland, I found that the fishermen, I'd been working with the scientists, both uh, American and Canadian. Uh, when I immediately, once I got in with the fishermen, um, they, they, that's why this is so uh, important to me as a, as a symbol. This is a figurehead that I carved myself. Uh, the fishermen used to talk to me through this bird, uh, through this figurehead. They'd say, ah, oh, little Aki, first we did it to your ancestors and now we're doing it to the fish. Uh -huh. In other words, the fishermen could see the coming collapse of the fisheries before the scientists did. Mm -hmm. so I called my scientist friends and said, hey, these guys are telling me that the fishery is about to collapse. Uh -huh. And they don't listen to them. They'll always talk that way. There are uh -huh. plenty of fish out there. Well, uh, really? Yeah, really, yeah. Uh, and, in my uh, lifetime, I don't so, remember anybody ever saying uh, that. And in the meantime, I'm, I'm, I have to keep backing up here. The the uh, Nova had not fully funded the the film. Mm -hmm. Well, they had shown an interest in it, but they didn't commit themselves to it until a week into my my trip. We got a telephone. <laughs> I got a telephone call from the Lincoln Aquarium. Said, "Hey, these guys are going to fund whatever you need to have the film crew come once a month." And we had I had funding just for that one first visit and. Uh, so then Nova came in, so we were able to, uh, to have the, the promise of three more uh, uh, film visits by the Nova crew. Mm -hmm. So when they came the second time, I said, hey guys, this, this film is about the fish. And uh, I, had, I had a lot of trouble with them because they were afraid that Nova would, would reject changing the storyline. I, right. I don't care if they change the storyline, I'll do it with slide film like Ken Burns. Yeah. But they, they eventually bought into it. Um, and, uh, well, and one of the things that contributed to it was that the fishery did in fact collapse the year mm -hmm. uh, I did it. Okay. And that shows on the film. I was in the room with, where the fisheries minister of Canada said I decided to shut the fishery down at 12 o'clock tonight. Uh -huh. And uh, that, uh, imagine something like any one person in America having the ability to do right, that, we right, just don't right. have it. But it was sad, uh, it, you know, it gave the film a great boost, but it was very, very sad. And it, and it still remains probably, uh, arguably, the greatest ecological tragedy of the, of the 20th century mm -hmm. was the collapse of the Grand Banks fishery. Right. That's 20 some years ago, and it still has not come back. How can it? No How can it? I mean, they're still yeah. fishing it. Because they, they, they fished it out, and they also uh, altered the, 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 the habitat. So, you know, there's a whole combination of things was, uh, and then the uh, slight temperature changes mm -hmm. all contributed to a collapse from which there seems to be no recovery. And right. I just fear that the same thing could happen here. Mm -hmm. uh, although, you know, there was, it's, a, it's a different habitat. Our water is warmer, the, the fish mature uh, faster, mm -hmm. so it, 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 things grow more slowly in the, the very, very cold water of Newfoundland. Right, right. Yeah. <coughs> but ultimately, well, ultimately. Uh, the, the warmer temperature is, is simply a means of, of prolonging it. Yeah. It's not, it's not and stopping no. it. And, uh, no, and there is, a, you know, there is a, a limit, I think, to mm -hmm. the pressures that any animal out there can have. And right. uh, um, it's, it's hard. You, you've said it. The fishermen uh, understand on the one hand, uh, and on the other hand, they have the same kind of money problems that the rest of the world has. Right. And it's easy for, easy for you and me to say, well, uh, uh, go easy on the fishing, or cut back, or even mm -hmm. cut back entirely. <coughs> but you know, they have mortgages, they have kids they'd like to send to college, they have uh, hospital bills like right. everybody right, else. And these put enormous pressures on them. But uh, so it makes it hard for individuals and for uh, for vessel owners, but for I, I, I guess I guess what my yeah. conundrum is that, of course, all of those things that you say are true as far as they're the, you know they're they're um, having the same problems that we all have. But the bottom line is the different the difference is if you're working for somebody else for some you know a car company or mm -hmm, you know right. a store or whatever, um, you're not in control of your resources. No. Whereas fishermen are you know they're self-employed. Right. And um, it's really only they can, can you know, I mean, I, I know that there are agencies out there that are saying you need to limit the number, and, and, and there are even agencies out there that's enforced that they limit their numbers. But I guess what I don't understand is why they're upset about that, because they, on their daily, in, their, on, in their daily rounds, they, they can't um, do the census of the fish and stuff right. like that. The agencies that do censuses of the fish mm -hmm. are doing it to hand it to them so they can say, um, okay, well, we can sh continue to, sh to, to fish 
this particular kind of this species, mm -hmm. but we need to limit that and look for another species or whatever mm -hmm. while that one regenerates. Because the bottom line is, you think you have problems now, yeah. you know, if you fish out that species that you specialize mm -hmm. in, not to mention like, you know, when they, when they rake the, the, the grounds for, uh, for shellfish and stuff, and you, and you ruin the beds of other species, you think you have problems now. What yeah. do you think is going to happen when it's all gone? You know, your children are not going to be able That's to right. do that for a living. Yeah. Um, and I guess what I just don't understand is the acridity that that that, um, that well, they seem to have. What, and I'm not saying they all do. Yeah. I mean, obviously, you know, what you see in the news is only the 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 uh, icons of, of right. what uh, what the news wants you to see because if it bleeds, it leads. So I'm but. I'm Fish sure there. I'm yeah. sure there are logical fishermen out there. But, oh, absolutely. But the, but yeah, the ones that yeah, the yeah. ones that yeah, are right. so upset, I I just don't understand mm -hmm. that. And I'm not trying to pick on them because it's not just that industry. Well, it's it's just, uh, what, the fishermen what, tend to get blamed for it, but it's really uh, you know the 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 forces on the periphery of the fishery create the pressures. Mm -hmm. When you think of uh, uh, all of the businesses that depend on the, the fishery, the trucking industry, mm -hmm. the refrigeration industry, mm -hmm. the supermarkets, <coughs> right. the hotels, the restaurants, these all people all have their own lobbyists who right. put pressure on, on the government. Uh, and another thing uh, that's, it's, that's it true. is commerce driven more than even the science can be commerce driven. When mm -hmm. you think about it, the Department of Commerce is the overall agency of the National Marine Fisheries Service. You know, they were founded on this yeah. day, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, um, and that was true in Canada, too. And I talked with people who would say that, you know, who were the scientists, honest scientists, mm -hmm. uh, who would have the, the people up above them who were the ones planting the fish plants and hiring the, uh, because, uh, you know, they'd have these fish processing plants that was the major employment for mm -hmm. in Newfoundland for the right. people who weren't actually catching the fish. Right. So it's an entirely fish-based economy. And they'd come to these scientists and say, well, what's the sustainable yield for this year? And the scientists were getting worried. And they'd say, well, you know, they'd name a figure that, that the was commercial not the people didn't they like because they'd right. already uh, hired the staff for these huge fish processing right. plants. So they kind of nudged the figures up a little more and a little more. And I saw a t very telling sign as I came down the coast <laughs> Thank uh, you. that on the dock should see, we accept no fish smaller than 24 inches. That would be crossed out but don't, then with 22 inches written right. there, and then with 18 inches. And by the end, they were catching fish that weren't sexually mature. Uh -huh. And that's why they shut the fishery down, because right. there, were no, there were no fish. Yeah. Uh, well, it's tough. Okay. Uh, All right, um, we're we need to take a, yeah. a quick uh, weather break here, and we'll be right back with Dick Wheeler. Okay, uh, you are watching your daily gumbo TV from the studios of WCTV in Wareham. Yes, you are. And we're here <coughs> in our first segment of Cape Cod Clam Chatter with Dick Wheeler, adventurer and, and uh, scientist. Well, no, I'm not a scientist. Well, <laughs> naturalist. I'm sorry, I should say naturalist. I kind of cringe every time I hear uh, myself called an adventurer because uh, I subscribe to uh, uh, the response, the, the definition that that uh, Hillary, the, the mountain climber, uh -huh. gave to that. When he came uh -huh. down off uh, Everest, people asked him if he'd had any adventures. And he said, one only has an adventure when one makes a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> I have found that I tried I to avoid that. adventures. Uh, <laughs> but I did, in fact, have some because I made some mistakes. Yeah, that happens. Yeah. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about the, the, the trip itself. Well, it, it took a, uh, a lot of planning. Uh, I really didn't have the time uh, to do all the training that I would like to have done for it. Um, people asked me if I was in shape, and I said, well, well, I hope to be by the end of the trip. <laughs> uh, uh, as it turned out, I had, a, and I had a, an injury. I injured my knee <coughs> in a freak accident uh, about six months before uh, I did the trip, so I wasn't on a cane right up until just before. Oh, I, I man. Did. So I hoped for an easy beginning. Uh -huh. Unfortunately, one of the hardest days of the, the whole experience and of my life was that very first day. As, uh, yeah, Mother Nature's like that. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. What did right. you say you wanted? Oh, an easy day? Mm, easy day. Nah, not going to happen. <laughs> well, there's no such thing as an easy day uh, when you come in, when you're at, at the Funk Island, because uh -huh. there's, a there's a, just like Buzzards Bay, there's a strong wind. The difference was I was 40 miles off the coast, uh, uh, for off mainland. The wind was right in my face, and it was, uh, it started out, you can see in the film, about you know, five or ten knots, which is quite manageable, but then it quickly went up to 15, and with a 400-mile fetch to where the waves were coming from, 
they were they were you know con for for a kayak I was out of the, the kind of water that I should you know, be in uh -huh. I'm going to see and if I can the wind did get up to 20 miles an hour and it was just very very tough slogging um, it was, it was, sorry sorry I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm actually trying to it, um, it took uh, I think it's 17 hours uh, uh -huh. to make it to the mainland it was uh, wow I started six, by six o'clock in the morning I finished it uh, Two o'clock that uh, night, and they had to lift me out of the boat. It was uh, wow. I, 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 my legs had been asleep for about seven or eight hours, um, and I think I actually did some permanent damage to really? one, one, uh, the, the nose in one foot. Uh -huh. But it, uh, the the uh, a side benefit of it was that uh, there wasn't much going on in Newfoundland, and I was on the one television. Uh, program and the one radio program right across all of Newfoundland and Labrador, and uh, that uh, gave me a lot of support among the fishermen. Uh -huh. And they knew I was very serious about what I was doing. If I had come in from the funks and uh -huh. that funny little boat, <coughs> right? So then from there on, it was uh, just a collection of of day day trips. Uh -huh. uh, and some of them were just just pure joy, and some were very difficult. Uh -huh. Bruce, can we um, get the put my map up there? I just want to show people where Funk Island is, Compa compared to compared to 505 Main Street in Wareham, which is down here. So you can see the Crown of Maine here. It's it's very low in the water. You can't see it until you're uh, yep. about five miles away. It's uh, about a quarter of a mile long, and so we get Newfoundland right here, and it's off the east coast of Newfoundland. My mouse is just not behaving today. So it is just a, a small dot yeah. <laughs> off the coast of Newfoundland. And there's nothing that's in between there. Wow. Yeah, wow. It. Wow. All right, that's enough of that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I just want people to, to understand where, yeah. where it was. So um, the, what, what, what time of the year did you go? I started on July 14th. The people say, oh, well, so why right did you start so late? There was, uh, there was pack ice mm. where right. I was right up until 10 days before. Not uh, anymore. Uh, so and it was even dangerous going out uh, because there were a lot of uh, uh, flows that were just level to the water. And there were icebergs, you know, 10 stories high everywhere. It was really spectacular. Uh, but uh, it also meant that I was starting as the days were getting shorter. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, you know that, that people say, well, I didn't just get an earlier start. I couldn't because it was solid ice uh, just two weeks right, before. Right. That was unusual. Uh, <coughs> it's usually clear before then. Is but, it? Uh, the, the ice that I was experiencing was not ice that was made in Newfoundland. It's blown over I from come down. Greenland. Uh -huh. And normally it would uh, blow back in the June winds. But uh, something funny that year made it blow back all over. Probably El Nino. Yeah, probably El <laughs> Nino. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> Uh, but I had wonderful support from the fishermen, um, and the, uh, I, I found what I described as aggressive hospitality among the Newfoundlanders. And uh -huh. We have no idea what hospitality is. You have no idea until you've experienced Newfoundland hospitality. Oh, yeah. We had something uh, recently, fairly recently, after 9-11, um, there were hundreds of planes grounded in Newfoundland. Ten, there were 10,000 people who were just uh, on these planes really? that landed and weren't uh, allowed to come into New York. They were totally absorbed by Newfoundlanders who took them into their homes. Wow. I'm telling you, they could have stayed there for the rest of their lives without the Newfoundlanders complaining. Wow. I mean, a Newfoundlander will give you the shirt off his back if it's the only shirt he has. They uh -huh. are truly hospitable. Uh -huh. They used to fight over me when I came in. Are <laughs> you staying with me? No, he's staying with me. And, uh, <laughs> well, that's nice. Yeah, oh, they're wonderful. Yeah, yeah. there's nothing like it. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So what's the uh, area like in Newfoundland? What's the, um, like, forest, rocks, what, what's the... They call it the rock. Oh, okay. Uh, and uh, it makes it spectacular for a person in a small boat, but it's kind of scary to be paddling along uh, a coast that where the, the cliffs are sheer cliffs, mm -hmm. uh, 100 feet tall, and you can go for 12 or 15 miles without any way of getting ashore, no uh, har harbors. Wow. And in the meantime, in the normal swell in the uh, parts of Newfoundland can be, uh, uh, there's no exaggeration swell, we're not talking waves, but a swell is, often three or four meters. Uh -huh. That's, you know, that's, that's higher than right. this, this room. And uh, that's, the, the swell is disposed, you know, I could never handle a 12-foot wave, mm -hmm. but uh, in a tiny boat, uh, 
anything. A, a swell is just a, a mound of water as opposed to a curl. The, when they hit the cliff, right. it, it just it goes all the way up 100 feet into uh -huh. solid white water. Yeah. And the noise is like, uh, oftentimes uh, all day long, the noise I was hearing was like being on the, on the end of a, of a jet runway. Uh -huh. It's just a very strong, powerful thing. But then I'd go around the corner and there would be a break in the cliff and you go inside and there's an idyllic cove and all uh -huh. these little wonderful houses and uh, the wonderful people and uh, lots of good food. Uh -huh. yeah. So um, starting at, um, at Funk Island, yeah. um, how often were you going from Funk? I mean, it looks like a pretty yeah. decent, decent battle from Funk Island that was back 40, to the... 40 miles. That's 40 yeah. miles. That's uh, wow. like um, twice the distance from, from here to, from Plymouth to... Um, Provincetown. Right. Yeah. Now, were you were you landing on any of those smaller islands that are out just outside Newfoundland there that are there some clearly less than? Along, there are some tiny <laughs> islands along the coast. Um, there were the islands, uh, all, not all along the coast, but from there to St. John's, there were the islands that you, uh, and I had the same island experience in, in Nova Scotia. So I have two but, questions for you, um, uh, then. Um, what is the wildlife like? Oh. Actually, three. Yeah. What, what was the wildlife like? Um, were you armed with any cameras? And um, oh, what was my third question? How often? I mean, I, I know they came to visit you. That Nova came to see you three times. Right. I had. What, what did they do? Okay. I mean, how close did they yeah. get? Would uh, they help you out if you were about to sink, et cetera? Uh, no. It, uh, they were. You know, you can see on the on the Nova film, mm -hmm. they had the camera people on the fishing boat that. It's been a while since yeah, I've seen I it. I never so. would have done that trip. It would have been foolhardy to do that trip without an accompanying vessel. Okay. So, uh, you know, if I had, a, had I tipped over, they were ready to get in the okay. dinghy to see behind okay. them. And, you know, to be sure, the water was 41 degrees. Right, so you're they not going to last much quickly. more than four or five minutes. Yeah, you, you're starting to die when you get into right. the water at you know, that temperature. Uh, when they, then they, they followed me. You know, we had them, for, uh, had them for two days, three days that first uh, trip. And they came back up and met me on the south coast of uh, Newfoundland. And, uh, no, we had a, another another two or three days of filming then. Another one, actually, when I was in St. John's, and then uh, and they met me in Nova Scotia uh, a couple of times, mm -hmm. and again in Maine. So we pieced it together that way. But on board, I had a, a camera mounted in front of me. You can again see that. In the I thought that I, w I thought that's what that was. Yeah. Film. I had to. I was before. It was a butterfly camera. It was tilted yeah, sideways, it wasn't it? Tilted up, yeah. and uh, I could only use it in calm weather because it, it affected my balance. Right. Right. Uh, but I, uh, it was before TV had reached the stage of being useful. I mean, there were, at, at that time, if you recall, if you had TV cameramen. You had someone behind him lugging these great big batteries. Right. So right. the batteries, well, I couldn't carry the batteries. Right. right. Then. So I used uh, 16 millimeter. You know, they call it mm -hmm. dinosaur equipment. Yep. Uh, yep. And uh, then uh, I also had an eight millimeter waterproof uh, uh, camera mm -hmm. that I used occasionally. And uh, so we pieced all of this film together and actually bought some film uh, from the National Film Board of Canada, which is the underwater shots of the, of the birds. Oh, okay. Uh, so we had, I think. So we you went into scuba diving with the, with the birds? I, no, <laughs> you no, went I, I have done plenty of it, but I. Uh, not, you know, th not, not that, that stuff. So we pieced together, I think we started with about 20 or 30 hours of film, mm -hmm. and we had first to get it down to 58 minutes for the rough cut. Right. Uh, no, no, we had no get it down to an hour and 20 minutes for the and rough cut. And how much cut. did you start with, did you say? Yeah, we started with about 20 hours of film. Uh, it's, it's very painful. Right, oh I, yeah, yeah. I, I, I cried a couple of times when they took things that they said they had to take out. Right, right. Because it was really so much a part of that. Do you I, have all that, all that yeah, stuff? Yeah, I think you somebody don't? has it all, yeah. Uh, you can always edit it together yeah. again, you know. Yeah. Right. Well, some There's of the facilities here, you know. Yeah. You know they say something. I had some, some kind of funny outtakes yeah. that uh, uh, didn't fit into right, the, the right. tone of the whole film. But uh, it was an interesting process, and uh, you know, I spent a lot of time writing the narrative and delivering uh -huh. it. So it took two years to put the thing together. Mm -hmm. So you had a twenty, basically a twenty-one shooting radio, ratio. Yeah. Well, yeah. 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 So you got plenty left. The hard <laughs> part was getting from uh, uh, from uh, from about seventy minutes down to fifty-five mm -hmm. minutes and thirty seconds. Uh -huh. And it was really funny size. I said, how are you, when it gets down to just a few seconds, how are you going to do that? And uh, Chris Knight said, it's easy. you get a lot of kayak scenes. I'll either speed you up or slow you down. There you and go. Get, <laughs> uh, that's when he said, art is a lie that tells the truth. <laughs> and that, that was another interesting thing. That's, I, 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 you I, know, I've never heard that. the first time I'd done anything art like this. And I got all upset when they, they, they changed the, the, uh, 
the, the time of them. You know, the, the progression, want, they wanted the progression, and I did too, to go from hook and line fishing to the traditional square uh, 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 trap net that the mm -hmm. Newfoundlanders use to the, uh, the kind of fishing that was done with uh, dories, uh, the, uh, the mm -hmm. Grand Bank schooners, to the kind of fishing done today. Mm -hmm. And in the actual filming of it, it, it wasn't in that order. So right. but I, I thought it was going so dishonest to have it in in, uh -huh. in, a, in, a, in not in the order in which they actually right. did the film. Right. The, pro the problem is with doing, it, with doing it in the order that it actually occurs in, in your life Correct. is that yeah. it's really difficult yeah. to tell yeah. the story. But uh, I, I like that. Who said that it, art is a lie that tells Picasso. the truth? Oh, really? Picasso. Wow, That's I've read a lot I'm of stuff, but I've never, never come across that. What's that? What do you think about it? it? There were the that use lines that lead your eye. And yeah, right, right. It, it, uh, yeah. So uh, it's not, no, not a lie in the conventional sense, right, but right. Uh, it's, a, it's a, a sleight of hand kind right. of thing. Uh, but it was a very interesting experience, and it, it was well received. Uh, and it went all around the world. Uh -huh. uh, and then, uh, then interesting things happened as a result of it. The, uh, that's what, that was my next question. Uh, yeah, what, what, uh, what, what are the lessons that were learned? Well, you know, as I was planning the film, I just networked with everybody. Someone said to me, there's a guy I want you to talk with. I made sure that happened. One of them was a, uh, a person who said, you've got to talk to J.O. Callahan. He's a storyteller. He lives in uh, Marshfield. Yep, yep. I had not heard of J.O. Callahan. I didn't realize. I was going to ask you if you had a, a relationship with him. rebirth of the storytelling. Yeah. And, uh, but I went and talked with Jay, and boy, there was something. Uh, this was before I did the trip. And he, he saw something there and uh, stayed right with me. He, mm -hmm. he kept in touch all through the summer. Uh, my communication to the rest of the world was uh, a, a telephone credit card. Yeah, well, if, you, if you uh, Google you, that's who you get is J.O. Callahan's yeah, page. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so I stayed in touch with, with Sandra. And he's actually the only one I have on the, sh on the and, show as well. Oh, so. God, you, yes, he, he's, he's terrific. Uh, and he kept in touch that way, and he's right on the beach when I finished uh, on the, the, the beach down oh, at really? Mass Maritime Academy. Jake Alcala and was there, and we started then. Uh, I, I've talked with Jay more about more things uh, about the trip than I have with anyone. Uh -huh. I probably he said hundreds of hours. Uh -huh. He took two years putting it together, and uh, then he, he premiered it in New Zealand. Uh -huh. uh, and then a, it was the feature of the National Storytelling Festival that year and three years since then. It was, right. He did it again last year and they asked him out of all the stories he done to tell that great ox story. Uh -huh. So he has done more to raise awareness than I have been able to do. He's uh -huh. really wonderful at it. And uh, then the other booths too that have just come from occasional magazine uh -huh. articles. Now what about uh, people like um like the Department of Commerce and, and um, uh, what is it? I'm trying to think down in uh, um, Woods Hole there. Uh, the National Marine Fisheries. The what? The National Marine Fisheries. Yes, yeah, yeah. thank you. That's the one, yes. Have, have they used any of it? Have they, I mean, for two, I mean, not only for display purposes at the museum there, but uh, have they used any of it uh, for, for lessons as, uh, as far I, as? I don't, I don't know. I think it's been uh, well received and appreciated. Uh, Everywhere, as it, uh, um, I just it, I think it just has a, uh, uh, it's a metaphor that people can relate to. Mm -hmm. uh, it's been very useful in schools. Now that's uh -huh. an, that's an interesting point. We were making a, a film for Nova. Mm -hmm. uh, the filmmaker had done a number of films for Channel Two and the Adventure Channel. Uh, he was afraid that uh, unless everything I said, as a non-scientist was corroborated by a real scientist mm -hmm. that NOVA wouldn't accept it. So in the original version of the film, we had tracked down the top scientists on birds, on fish, and, and, uh -huh. and just everything that was out there. So you know, I'd say, say as this English lit major, nat right. an amateur naturalist, these opinions of mine based on my own feelings and what I picked up from the fishermen, they wanted, because it was NOVA, to make sure it was backed with science. Right. So right. We, when we showed the, the film, for the for the rough cut they call it, mm -hmm. which is a scary experience because um, you know, Paula Aptel, who still runs Nova, is meant to be a, an iron iron lady, uh -huh. and uh, if you didn't pass uh, her test, then you weren't going the film was not going uh, not going to be shown. And we watched as uh, as she in fact she didn't make any she'd make a couple of notes, but didn't know change in her expression. And that was all over. 
uh, the, the head filmmaker. Yeah, but it's an exchange in your yeah. expression, just like he sweating. Said, yeah. <laughs> you know, how, do, well, how did you like it? And she remember she said, it's, it's charming, it's wonderful, but get those scientists out of there. And we said, why? He said, because they're going to be interested in the guy in the kayak, and that sidetracks them. So just, yeah, and he says everything really? that needs to be said. So that was a, a great compliment. Yeah, it yeah. Was a, yeah, that there wasn't a, See? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's so great. It, it really was, and, and, and they were, uh, so I guess it got better as it got shorter, I'd have to say. It's uh -huh. like poetry which, which, and, and art. It, what you leave out is very important. Right. Yes. And, uh, it's elegant. Know, elegance. It creates yeah. elegance. Yeah. But it's, it's still, I mean, what I like about it, why I'm st still here t t touting it, even though it's sort of uh, built around me in a sense, is that it, 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 it gives people a good understanding of, the prog of how uh, fishing has progressed mm -hmm. from people doing it just for subs you know, subsistence right. to people trying to feed a world that is right. too large. And right. I think that's what, where I have arrived in my, in my own understanding. Everything we talk about is trumped by our own overpopulation. And uh, mm -hmm. you know, it's so easy for us as humans to say there are too many seagulls, there are too many raccoons, yeah. too many coyotes, right. too many mosquitoes, but we never say there are too many no, humans. No, you're talking to the wrong guy. Yeah. I say that all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody here not ever hear me say that? <laughs> So it, in, a, and it, in a non-controversial way, it, does, yeah. it raises that uh, uh -huh. issue, I think. Yeah. And it also makes you realize that you know, we're all a part of the problem. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we can leave the studio and go out and have uh, fried uh, fish and chips. Right. Not me, but yeah. <laughs> some, uh, some, some of the people might hear. Yeah. Might hear. <laughs> but uh, you know, it's, it's, part, it's of the reason, part of the reason I'm a vegetarian is because of the, uh, the amount of um, resources that mm -hmm. it takes to like for example raise a cow it's just, mm -hmm. I just think it's 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 too much resources as far as I'm concerned to feed me yeah. with with a cow I don't I don't want anything to do with that I mean there's other reasons you know well, it's, it's so frustrating really because on the one hand we are cutting back on fishing pressures mm -hmm. and at the same time though we're creating new markets uh, you can't go to a, a, a pub in England now that doesn't at least once a week have lobster on the menu. Right. And it used right. to be just a rarity over there. It was illegal, it in, was illegal. in Massachusetts. Right. You probably yeah. know that. Yeah. You know, it was yeah. illegal to serve uh, lobster more than was it more than twice a week. You yeah. could put the wife in jail because yeah. she served lobster too often. <laughs> I mean, they pitchforked them off the beach. That's now they're exactly they're. Right. Yeah. I mean, they, 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 yeah. as far as I can see, they're in the in the process of evolving onto becoming land animals. Yeah. Um, but uh, <laughs> no more. You know. Well, I subscribe to the, uh, the, uh, the notion now, I think it was Dennis Meadows who, who said it, um, that any environmental issue that does not list human overpopulation as the number one problem is mm -hmm. a lost cause. And That's I, probably I, I, true. When you think about it, yeah. any environmental issue that you can talk about is uh, it, <coughs> worsened by our right. own in increasing right. numbers. Well, it's because yeah. our, our religion, our, our, our major religions, mm -hmm. as well as just, mm -hmm. you know, it, what the cultures that have come mm -hmm. out of, even people say, well, I don't believe in God, I don't believe in any of that kind of garbage. Um, e they're still part of a culture that came out of those religions, and, and it still puts human beings as the supreme exactly, being yeah. on the planet. And yeah. until we get over ourselves, mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's going to remain being that I'm issue. I'm you're right. Yeah. Well, a, you know, the interesting... Um, there's a, a statement on the, the stationery of the Committee for Concerned Scientists. You know, mm -hmm. These are people who have achieved the highest right. award. The They're all peer-reviewed. Yeah, and right. when you get to, to reach that stage, you can say anything you want. Right. Until then, you have to be worried about all your fellow scientists right. who say, wait a minute, he can't prove what he said. Right. Uh, right. But when they reach that stage, they can. And what does their stationery say? Uh, I think I'll, I'll get it right. It said, uh, uh, if we do not solve our own population problem sagely and humanely, mm -hmm. the problem will be solved for us by nature, right. efficiently and savagely. Yes, uh, and I, I absolutely yeah, correct. And I, yeah. I, think, uh, I like that. Yeah. It's, uh, we, I know, can you say are, that one more time? You know, we have a feeling that we can solve all of our problems right. with technology, and the problems that technology uh, create we saw with more technology. Well, you're right, and the thing is, you, you can kind of see we're, we're down to down to the wire here, but you can kind of see that um, you know, a, as as human beings solve each of these problems that nature hands us, other ones come in that we're not, we're just simply not capable of handling. You know, it, right. it, it basically the bottom line is nature has always always been able to handle the populations that nature wanted to handle. That's it right. got rid of the populations it wants to get rid of, yep. and it increases the populations it wants to increase. 
uh, it's going to win in uh, the end, no matter how you uh, cut this it. Is a, as we head into the baseball season, uh, mm -hmm. a good line is nature bats last. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Dick Wheeler, hey, thank you very, very much for coming. We really, really appreciate it. Just hang out right here. We, we just got uh, some quick announcements for, I guess, just tomorrow. Okay, Paul. Tomorrow we have Barbara and Dick Porter visiting us for the day. Yep. And next week we have Monday, we have Don Bell, who is a writer and a chef and teacher at Cape Cod Community College, as well as Tracy from the Gallery Consignment Shop. And Tuesday, we have Barbara Porter again with uh, Celtic sweaters. I'm sorry, Celtic, Celtic sweaters. Celtic, not Celtic. <laughs> and Arts in Action with Linda Calise. That's right. GQ and the lady. Yeah. Well, that's it for today. This, we're, this, you're watching your dailygumbo.tv. Uh, thanks for tuning in. I hope we'll see you tomorrow. And um, take care of the people that you love and love the people you take care of. We'll see you in the morning. Bye now.